Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank. Paul is back. You like that's the same enthusiasm from the first one. I like the enthusiasm. It's the name Paul just gets me every time. Um, <laughs> Paul is a writer. Yeah, it's safe to say, right? Author, artist, creative. I, I dabble, you know. I I have uh yeah, I do. I um I publish some poems uh and uh working on I am I'm working on putting putting a few of those together and um and I have a book uh, this past fall, a book about uh, the Greek god Pan that came out. So, yeah. And there's another thing I thought last time I messaged you about what talking about. I just remembered it, actually. Um, let's see, because I know it's in your bio. My new book, uh, you have Pan in there. You had something else in there, too, that I didn't realize. I think it was on your oh, site. Yeah, yeah I wrote um, a few. This was a few years back. I think it was uh, 2007, but um, I published uh, really an academic book, but it's about a writer named David Jones, who uh, was also an artist. Uh, he, he was an interesting, interesting guy. He, he fought in World War I. Um, he was really kind of traumatized by that. He was kind of a recluse for the rest of his life, but he um, painted uh, paintings of like landscapes and mythological subjects and uh, his poems um, so it kind of it's kind of on the borderline between poetry and prose. A lot of what he wrote, but um, his first book was called In Parenthesis, and uh, it was an account of uh, his time as a soldier. And you know, a lot of the the writers from the First World War were were officers. You know, they they saw the war from from that perspective. But um, Jones was uh, a private. He was just an ordinary soldier in the the British Army, and he kind of brought that perspective to to the experience, you know, and, you know, having to slog through the mud and uh, be put in danger and a lot of time waiting around, being given boring fatigue duties to complete and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, he wrote about the war and then uh, he went on to write a long poem called The Anathemata in 1952, which uh, really is is about, it's about the whole of Western culture. It's, it's a pretty tough read. It's a difficult poem. Um, but he tries to include Greek and Celtic myth, uh, stories about King Arthur, um, really kind of rooted in um, the landscape of, of Wales and uh, the history of London, which was where he lived um, pretty much his whole life. And, um, and then a uh, final collection, the year of his death, trying to bring together some of the fragments he'd written. But uh, like a lot of veterans, he, he suffered from some mental health issues. And in those days, the doctors put put people on sedatives and um, that really impacted his ability to kind of think clearly and uh, kind of organize his thoughts and, and organize the things he wrote into to book form. So um, he, he was known by a lot of the, the great writers of his day, like the, the poet T.S. Eliot, for example. Um, but uh, he, he's not, he's not as well known as I think he should be. Um, and uh, he's a, he's a really interesting, really interesting guy, really interesting writer. So I want to pick your brain a little bit before that. Yeah. Real quick. This microphone piece is scratching against your collar of your. Oh, is it? Yeah. Sorry about that. There you go. Okay. All right. I want to pick your brain on the creative process of things as well, too. Not only yeah. in your writings as well, but also what you choose to really kind of, because I feel like once you can get a tone, much like a song, for instance, can capture a certain mood or a certain feeling that it gives you. But where do you feel like your creative process flow the best like do you feel like they i guess you get your creative juices going when you're in a happier mood when you're in a sadder mood i did a film recently and i felt like i was more i guess creative when there was more about pain and mm -hmm. experience of things that i know very well such as like being uh, not, not not like oh poor robbie but alone um 
a lot of those types of things, when you start to dive in the realm of what your thoughts are, like when you're able to only bounce your thoughts off with inside of your head, kind of like throwing a racquetball at a wall and just having it bounce all around. That's where I found that I could easily create inspiration out of stuff, but not to make it so serious where people would call for help, but to make it to a point where it got the mood across. Yeah, um, I think you know it's it's interesting kind of reading reading different writers lives and and kind of looking where they they find their inspiration and i you know and thinking i mean i i think for myself if i'm thinking about whether i'm you know whether i'm writing say an, an article or um maybe sitting down to try to draft something a little more creative like like a poem i think um i think feeling i i think kind of feeling disturbed or bothered by something um or kind of really wondering about something, you know, I, but I think there has to be, uh, at least for, for me, there, there's got to be something that's, um, that's bothering you a little bit, you know, a sense of, a sense of unease, um, feeling like you're, you're, you need to explore something in a little more depth, you know, whether that's, a, you know, a, a feeling or a situation, um, or a topic, or, you know, really, uh, really feeling bothered by something, you know, I mean, the um, situation in the world, a personal situation you're in, um, I think, you know, those can also be kind of experiences that prompt us to, to write or to, to think a little more about, uh, about something that's, that's troubling us. But out of that, you know, you, you can generate something kind of positive, you know, creative, kind of a creative response that works through some of those, those negative feelings, you know, feeling a little disturbed or bothered, but also some of those more positive feelings about, you know, whether you're, you know, you're just really into something or you want to discover more uh, kind of the, because I think part of any kind of writing that's effective is, is the excitement of discovery. You know, even if you are kind of exploring a kind of darker place, but just sitting down and getting those words on the page, um, that can be that can be kind of a, a an exciting moment, and and once you've got those those initial words down, um, you know they they kind of uh, they take on a life of their own. Not so much that writing kind of happens on its own, but that you know one word suggests another, a phrase or an image or um, that kind of thing can lead to um, can lead in directions that you might not have have really thought, you know. And I think there, there are a lot of different reasons to write. I mean, some people um, write, you know, keep a journal for kind of therapeutic reasons or just to have something to record their feelings and experiences. Other people might want to take those and uh, turn them into something creative, whether it's a story or a poem or, um, w w you know, whatever it is. But I think that, um, yeah, the, f the first step is getting those words on the page. And I think what motivates us to do that is, is often a sense of, unease uh or or a sense of curiosity you know like yeah. what's going on here you think um like for instance uh you you've wrote one book but is, is it one book or you've written two I've written two yeah okay um is there a possible third coming out and then what do you think you're going to do because they're they're kind of different but they're kind of the same i mean you're still writing about a character whether it's a legend or whether it's an actual person that did exist you're still writing yeah. in kind of like a biography sense right, but no way yeah what about the poetry aspect of things because i know you're interested in that a lot yeah um right i think so hmm yeah, let me, let me try to answer that. So, um, yeah, I've published yeah I've published a few poems in magazines over the years, uh, online and print. And um, I started uh, kind of getting interested in in doing a bit more kind of creative writing uh, during the pandemic. I think like like a lot of people, um, you know, many of us had a little more time um, where we're we're stuck at home. Um, you know, I was I was working remotely, and uh, like a lot of people taking some time and sort of thinking, well, what, you know, what, what do you want to be doing? Because I think we, we all get very caught up in our day-to-day -day responsibilities, whether it's work or family or whatever it might be. And, um, I, and so I, I, uh, I signed up for um, a couple of workshop classes with uh, a writer I admire, a Canadian poet named George Murray. And um, that was a really great experience. And, you know, he, he really got us writing. We had to produce things every week. We got really great feedback. And uh, so 
I've been trying to continue that. Um, I've got a little online writing group going and um, I'm hoping, I don't know when, but yeah, I'm hoping to, to bring some pieces together uh, for uh, maybe a shorter book to start with. Um, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, and I think the, you know, the other side of it is, you know, it's the sort of, uh, I guess the prose writing and uh, having written on pan, I, you know, the book just came out in the fall. And so I've been kind of taking a little break, but, um, but I have been thinking a little bit about uh, what comes next. And uh, I honestly don't know. I think um, I'd like to try something a little different, maybe something a little more personal, but I think, um, yeah, I think it's important if you're, if you're thinking about a writing project, whatever that, that might be, um, you know, give, give yourself some, give yourself some breathing space to uh, kind of fool around, you know, try, you know, try imagining what, you know, if you're thinking about writing a book, try to imagine what that book would look like and, you know, try to, um, you know, put that into words, right? What, like, if you're telling a story, what kind of story do you want to tell? Uh, if you're writing, you know, as I, as I did with Pan, like a nonfiction book, you know, what, what are some topics that really interest you? And um, what are your thoughts about that? What are some questions that you want to answer? Um, I think there's, you know, we live in a society that really pushes us to produce a lot. And I think one, one step in the creative process that's really kind of important is, is the just stopping and asking some questions, um, you know, questions about what interests you. And if you've kind of got a couple ideas, it's like, well, what, what do you want to find out? Or if you were going to write on this, what, what would you want your readers, uh, what would you want your readers to learn about this? Or what do you hope to, to kind of, you know, bring to them? Um, and so I, you know, I think taking your time, not, not trying to rush something out, I think is, is a good way to approach it. Um, Cause books, uh, books honestly are a lot of work um, and it's not, not really a lot of glamorous work. You know, it's a lot of time alone um, in front of the keyboard or maybe with a, a pen and paper. So, you know, getting something, getting some questions that are really interesting on a topic that really kind of engages you or a story that you really feel you have to tell. I think that's, that's really important. I think um, the most books I've really been attracted to have been things that have been relatable, whether it's a God with power or something like that, but more about the feelings and the emotions that they experience, whether that's produced by the author, whoever wrote the book, probably not what they actually felt or what anything could really be felt. I look at like for Pan, for instance, if we go back to that, the loneliness factor, the factor mm -hmm. of being kind of, I guess, misunderstood in a sense of being a crucial character in the grand aspect of things. That's a very relatable thing for a lot of people that could be labeled or considered an outcast. And that's the one thing I was trying to do. Like when I made the film, for instance, for me, that's easier acting and that type of stuff is easier than writing. But mm -hmm trying to make things relatable like everyone knows like there's a scene where the seatbelt gets stuck like six seven times and you just go <sighs> like you know everyone knows what that's like of just having one of those types of days and i found the smallest things whether it's 10 15 seconds long can really impact a lot of things into what a people's mind is like you know what they've been going through what they can really pull out of it constant messages i got of like i love the camera angles i love the shots of it and i'm like i was just trying to create something that i know i could easily understand that experience like and i think it's all a concept of being relatable i think that's with anything that you do there's not a whole lot of relatability out there I mean, songs nowadays are about like having a fleet of McLarens and having a four star <laughs> mansion that you jump off yeah. the roof into a pool in. And it's like, but where's the relatableness? Like when I hear someone say like uh, there's a song called The Best Day by Atmosphere, where he talks about his uh, his tires are flat and like he's talking about he can't find his wallet because his wallet's not in his pocket. Like, don't remember the last time he saw it. Like, it's just lyrics like that where I'm like, everyone's been through those types of days where it seems like you're missing not only a piece of something that you have but a piece of yourself and whether you choose to channel that in anger or frustration i would say channel it in something creative channel it in something that you can get the pain out that actually feels like it's gone rather than just being a band-aid over top of it and i think that's a great way with writing for instance a lot of people kind of misunderstand the concept of it they think it's about just being a world-renowned author that might be a goal in mind, sure, but it's also great therapeutic for pain, much like a conversation for me is in a podcast. Yeah, I I think that um, I think that's one of the I think that's one of the reasons why people you know make art, whether it's you know whether we're talking about films or or you know books or stories or whatever it is, is that there 
you know, there is, there is a therapy element to it, you know, and a lot of times, um, you know, thinking about the way people keep, you know, or used to keep journals, uh, I think a lot of stuff that used to be private is, is a lot more public now, uh, you know, social media and stuff, but you know, people wrote down their thoughts at the end of the day to kind of clarify what they were thinking and feeling about things. And, that, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm someone who I don't really know what I think about something until I uh, kind of sit down and uh, write it out or, you know, maybe talk it out with somebody. But um, uh, that's, you know, that's a good way to kind of get, get those emotions out. And I think uh, if we think about, you know, maybe films we like or books or whatever, they, they are ones that we, you know, we feel in some way better after watching, you know, energized or satisfied or something. Um, you know, like I, I like the Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy. And, uh, we watch that every kind of every, every Christmas, um, we kind of watch all three of those. And there's such, to me, there's such a feeling at the end, like you feel like something has really been, really been accomplished. You've been with these characters for, you know, nine hours and, uh, you finally feel like, like something, you know, something meaningful, something powerful has happened. Um, but, but in general, you know, we, we respond to, to those books and, and films that, uh, I think work through an emotion for us and, uh, for people who create those, um, those things, the, the act of creating is a way of working out those emotions too. Like I think, and I think the, the stories, whether it's a film or, or in writing that stay with us the most are the ones that really do kind of work out those emotions, um, and they, they, you know, emotions that we all experience, right? So you're like, you're describing a scene in a film where the damn seatbelt isn't, isn't going in and we've all had that. And I think, you know, one of the things I admire about film is you, you can kind of convey those, the, those feelings visually, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to say, oh, this character is feeling really frustrated. She can't do her seatbelt out, uh, up. And if we're watching that on the screen, we're, we're feeling that along with the character because we've all done that. You know, we know the feeling is frustration and irritation. And it's one of those little daily things, kind of like losing your keys, which drive you absolutely crazy. But um, you know, it's just just part of just part of the human experience. And I think, you know, effective art, whether it's film or music, what have you, um, needs to connect with, with our feelings in that way. That experience. Also- I also think you can't be afraid in your own head of how people are going to receive this, whether whoever's going to watch it. Like for me, when I was doing the thing, I wasn't really thinking about like what people are going to think of it more on an aspect of how I felt or how I did something, knowing that maybe family members or close friends would view it. And then I had a bunch of people. I did a funny scene where I was just, you know, it was kind of deep and emotional. And a, a, a person did a review of my movie about it and said it was like, you know, you could tell it through all the laughter that there's a lot of seriousness and heavy tones mm-hmm. to it. I had people be like, I'm sorry that, you know, you had to go through something like that. It was like, wasn't really something I was going through, but it was something I wasn't afraid to show. I feel like a lot of people, like, for instance, if you were going to write a book about yourself, you might be afraid to be really open about a certain emotion or something in fear that maybe a family member would read it and have questions about it or have something like that too, which brings into the form of expression. Now, if this is a form of expression to be yourself, doesn't that get into some weird territory? when you're blinding those results or not trying to to be the person that you want to express all in fear that someone might come across it and have some thoughts on it. It's like watching what we say, for instance, in some cases that's good, but in also times it kind of deconstructs the flow of authenticity when you really actually feel something and you just want to speak your mind and hope that someone doesn't take it in the worst possible direction. But man, everything's through a lens right now. It gets a little bit difficulty and like art difficult. And like you said, with social media, it doesn't make it easier. Social media puts everything through a weird lens or a loophole. Like when I got a message, someone saying uh, like, Oh, so mix up on times, no drama. And then said, it's okay. But the no drama part, I've heard people bring up the word no drama as in like, I don't want any drama. I don't want any drama. Get away from me. I don't want any drama. The, the way they were saying it was, oh, it's no problem, but it's just the words right. that they say. But when it's written through a message, it's different. And you start to realize this weird back and forth optical lens view through a magnifying glass of social media shit. And it's just horrible. But in a sense, it 
I don't want that to block creativity out there. I don't want that to construct people's views or ideas of what they should be thinking at the time all on the basis of whoever's watching. Because then that I just feel like that's where the authenticity gets a little bit ruined. Yeah, I th- yeah, I think yeah, there's kind of yeah, there's a lot lot to unpack there. I think I, I think that <laughs> I think the the problem with the the problem with the the short message, you know, whether we're talking about something a little more, you know, worky like email or a, a tweet or whatever is the you're not there speaking the words so the tone is totally lost. Like so so your no drama is a really good example of that because if the person was there speaking to you you would know if they were telling you, hey, listen, I don't want any drama here. Or if they were just saying, hey, no problem, you know, because you can hear the tone. But when you see those, those little words, you kind of, you have to figure out what the tone is and you hope you get it right. Cause you don't want to, and some people just go off, you know, they don't, they don't kind of pause. They just immediately take offense. And that's, you know, that's the whole world of social media in a way. And that's kind of the difference between that. One of the main differences between that kind of communication and the kind of communication that um, you know we can we can achieve through more thought out uh, things like like film or story or you know a poem or something like that. Um, and I think this. So the other the other point you were you're kind of getting at that that I think is uh, is kind of challenging is this whole idea of being authentic, right? And communicating emotions that are authentic, but in ways that you know we feel are uh, um, uh, I don't know, that are, are going to, are going to communicate themselves m- most clearly and effectively. Um, so I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here for a sec, but, uh, I think, what, <laughs> I think what I'm getting at is, you know, we can't control how people respond to, to what we write or what we, we sort of put out there. Um, and I think that is a really good point for, for people thinking of creating something, whatever it is that, you know, you're not, you, you can be as cautious as you want and as careful as you want, but you, you can never foresee how people are going to react to, you know, your film or your, your story or your poem, um, any more than you can really control how they react to, to a tweet, uh, or, or something like that. But at least in, in kind of a longer form, you'll have a little more, opportunity to to clarify what you're doing um and i think writing personally or you know making maybe making a film personally um you know it doesn't you you can convey emotions without necessarily being autobiographical like if you have a really strong feeling about something or a, a really kind of dark kind of emotion you want to explore you don't necessarily have to just kind of write straight out hey this thing happened to me and it made me feel this way and you know, now I'm sad. You could actually take those feelings and kind of create a situation in which those feelings are, are part of. And, and you could kind of work through those feelings, maybe through, you know, some fictional characters, uh, some, uh, you know, maybe a, a write a poem or something from, or a story from someone's point of view, who's experienced something involving those feelings. That's not necessarily straight out autobiographical, but which can still be a way to work through them, you know, um, like it, the, the nice thing about creative work is it's imaginative, you know, you don't, it doesn't have to be 100% factual. And as we've seen the last few years, there's been, I can't think of any, I can't remember the title, but there's, there's been a few books the last few years where the authors presented their experiences as factual and then other people have called them out and uh, criticized them because there's a lot of fiction there, but um you know, there, there is room for taking personal experiences and transforming them into something imaginative, um, as long as we're clear that, that that's, that's what we're doing. If that makes sense. It just, it just lands in a weird land of like people with a magnifying glass. I picture just scrolling through text, looking for just anything that they can easily clip out and put somewhere, be like, explain yourself on this. And I'm like, I wouldn't expect that when it comes to like a creative work, but you see that a lot now. And I just think it's because of the amount of, I guess, social news that's out there with every single government article or whatever you want to say, causing people to examine every single word and every single detail. What did you mean in chapter three on page 26 when you said this, the sheep does not sleep at midnight? 
They have to examine that to understand what that is. And it's like, well, it was just a metaphor for, and then people just take it a different route. And it, it makes it a little bit difficult as a creator, for instance, like one of the biggest ones that's getting a lot of trending news right now is JK Rowling. She's just all over the board. Now, I don't know her views on anything or any concepts. I don't know anything about that, but just people attacking her for a goblin looking thing that might be something of this. And I'm just like, I have no clue. But it just makes it exhausting to look at the Harry Potter series now. And it's like, is that necessarily what that person was trying to create out of it? I don't know. But everyone pulls something out of something and it just gets into some weird line territory where it becomes like a creative artist or whether you're a painter or whether you're I mean, honestly, painting for me is dead. I was a painter. I thought I could paint a couple of things, but then I started doing creative AI art. Bro, anything I could, they does it in 10 seconds. I could spend months on something and never create anything as beautiful. I type in Atlantis, God, monk, and it gives me a monk and like this Icelandic land on top of Atlantis with the trident and it's all psychedelic. And I'm like, this is exactly what I want. I'm going to put it on a shirt. I can't do that, but a machine can. And that's where it's going eventually. That'll probably translate to books where you'll have books that are just typed out by a machine. And then is it the same? Is it? is it are we going to become like pan where we just fade off into nothingness because of all this idea of technology being able to do things faster and easier and that luxury is better than the actual process of doing it yeah i think uh i i've seen some of those ai images and some of them are they are pretty amazing you know and and there are um you know they they've taken some first steps uh with with AI, uh, you know, writing as well, you know, like creating a story or poem or something like that. And some of it's actually kind of interesting. Not, I, I feel, I still feel like there's something missing when, even with AI art, you know, there's, there is something missing. Um, but, uh, but I, I, it's not a hundred percent there. There's definitely, it's not a hundred percent there. Um, you know, but, but it is learning. And, um, I think artificial intelligence is, uh, is kind of promising, but it is to me, to me, it's a little frightening too, because it learns so quickly. Right. Um, Check this out. This is on my oh, yeah. shirt. Look wow. at that. That is really cool. That's a tree, but it's in this like weird kind of like a fantasy type thing. And this thing created yeah. it in three seconds. And it wow. creates, I mean, amazing artwork. Like I have this one with a Yeti in Atlantis that's going on a shirt. I can show you my newest one. I actually just created, I think sure. about, like an hour ago, but it, I call it the uh, creation because it honestly, to me, it looks like a religious kind of creation thing. And it's, that's intense, dude, for a three second art creation out of an AI. That is. Yeah. So I'm like, whoa, I, I can't do that. I'm realistic with my goals in life. And let me tell you something <laughs> that's, that's out the window for me, but I'm just saying it, that's, it, it, it scares me. Cause I feel like that can be translated to books and I haven't checked to see if that's out there, but if that's a free app that anybody can get and be able to create a work like that. When I look at it though, it captures the essence of what I think art is because the whole point of art is unexplainable. I can't explain that into words. I can't even tell you the description of what it looks like. And it's taking, like I typed in JFK in it and it gave me JFK's face. That was all kind of vivid imagery, but then it had the airplane in it. It had everything related that you could Google search JFK and show up. It had all of that in it, but it was all formed together in such a way where you're like, I can see the airplane. I could see that, but I can't understand what these, cause their pics are just slightly off. Right. And in a way like it is, it is fascinating because that is doing at least one of the things that artists do, which is like bring together, you know, bring together all the things maybe associated with the, the, uh, the topic they're writing on or the, the thing they're painting. Um, like I've, I'd mentioned this artist, David Jones, but his paintings, particularly his later ones, you know, if he was, if he was painting, you know, uh, say a myth uh, involving King Arthur or something, he would just, pack his painting full of every single thing he could think of that was associated with it. And in a way it reminds me of uh, what these, um, these AI paintings are doing because they're doing this kind of deep image search on the internet and they're pulling together all these different elements that, uh, you know, like if we think about JFK and an airplane, I mean, you know, he, he traveled a lot. We might think about, uh, 
you know, at the end where his, you know, his remains were put on board the plane and it's flying off and, and it's kind of suggesting all those things, but you know, it's, it's like, it's artificial intelligence that is doing this. And I don't know how, how different is that from the way our own kind of creative minds work, you, you know, like, well, we program the AI. It's basically a yeah. copy of you, but then it starts to learn on its own based on the metrics that you give it, such as like the Facebook uh, AI, for instance. It's basically a mini Mark Zuckerberg, but then it starts evolving on its own to become better than Zuckerberg and its thoughts, and it just takes its algorithm and runs with it. The weird thing is, is that music has already translated over to the digital thing. A lot of these beats like Old Town Road and all these types of famous top trendy things a lot of them are all created in a studio based on a machine doing it for you there's an app called boomy that'll do all you got to do is keep rejecting it if you don't like it and it keeps learning and learning and learning to find out oh wait you like the drums in this one you don't like the other stuff so i'll drop that and i'll add a guitar oh you don't like that guitar maybe i'll try a different guitar and it just gets into this realm of like dude they can start doing that with books all you got to do for this art type in a couple of phrases or a word saying I typed in something called nuclear winter wonderland. And it gave me what looks like a winter wonderland with a nuke made of ice going off in the background. That's so unexplainable where I'm just like, how did the, it's so good. And it's just a simple phrase and it does it in a matter of 10 seconds. They can do that with a book eventually, but I, I still feel different. I like it. I'm scared that I like it, but I like a Bob Ross. I see a Bob Ross and that man doesn't get the credit he deserves on anything <laughs> that he does. Yeah. I think, I think the speed of artificial intelligence is one of the things that's a little, a little frightening. And I don't know, you know, I don't know how long it's going to be till um, it can do, you know, things with language that are pretty inseparable from what a person can do. I don't know, uh, you know, if, if you, you know, if you, if you've used Gmail, you'll know that it has this kind of autocomplete feature where it'll suggest a phrase and it learns, right? So if you, if you usually say, um, you know, please find enclosed, whatever, it'll, it'll complete that phrase for you. But um, it is actually an initiative from Google for their artificial intelligence to learn language. And so everybody, millions of users around the world who are using their email system at work or for, you know, their personal stuff, um, Every time you're typing in, every time you accept or reject their suggested phrase, you're you're teaching Google's AI uh, how language works and the way people speak and the way people communicate. Um, and I, I mean, I I use uh, Gmail at at work, and it it is eerily accurate at suggesting what I'm going to type next. Um, and I remember when it first started, I would uh, always kind of reject the phrases it was suggesting, but over time, it's learned. And if you put that together, you know, whoever, however, hundreds of millions of users of Gmail around the world, um, it's going to, you know, it's going to learn how to use language uh, as well as we are. Um, Does that so. get scary as an as an author of where that technology <laughs> could be capable for? I mean, the fact that reading or writing kind of turned into typing in a sense, but they're still writing out there. But then it seems like with all this technology that's going out there, eventually it's going to end up to like some metaverse crap. And which is weird in itself, Walmart released a video of shopping in the metaverse. And that's really freaking nuts. I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't seen that one. I've, uh, I've read a little bit about the metaverse. I don't, I don't think I want to be there (laughs) myself. Some crazy avatar, but like online shopping there's a voice that tells you look over to your left and then you grab this wine thing it automatically scans your thumbprint from your id and your account and then you look at the bottle of wine it gives you the whole description in a bar thing you throw it in your cart and then as you get to the checkout as soon as you set checkout you pay with your thing you put your thumb up to the scanner thing it's all from your home vr then the shopping cart drives off and it says thanks for your purchase it'll be at your door shortly and a drone takes everything to your house and i'm like the world's gone to shit. Um, I'm going into my basement. Nobody talk to me. <laughs> it's a scary place, man. Well, it, it, I, it, I agree. And I think, you know, so for some people, that stuff is really fun. You know, they want to put on the goggles and do this thing and, you know, I, whatever. But I think when we've when got companies like big companies like Facebook, like Walmart, whatever, giving us the opportunity to have those experiences, we 
we have to pause and sort of ask, well, what are they getting out of it? You know, and I think the answer almost always is they're getting our data. Yeah. Right. And at this point, if we think about it, we think about what, you know, so Facebook maybe tracks our, the websites we go to. So they know what stores we shop at online or whatever. But I think when, when we start to think about like a meta verse kind of experience, what other kinds of information about us can they get? I mean, even thinking about shopping online, you know, they're, they're tracking information that we might not think is useful. Like, you know, do you, do you go towards the left when you enter the store to the right? You know, what are you right-handed or left-handed or, you know, like things like that, like right now, Facebook um, or, you know, other online or social media uh, sites, they don't have that information, but with the metaverse, they're going to be able to get a lot more information about us and our habits and how we move and, uh, and things. And I don't know, it makes, it makes me uncomfortable. I don't know what they could do with that information, but I feel like somebody could do something with it eventually. That's the scary thing is I think in-person visits to stores are just not going to happen anymore. Everything's going to be like an online shopping market because there's no incentive to leave your house when you can just do it from your phone or do it from the metaverse. That makes you feel like you're actually moving around in it. But right. the positive I like to see is the fact of maybe they can get to a point where they can take missing pieces of text or some type of like books that are out there and be able to recreate a new page, a digital kind of creation of that page where I start wondering of like, man, what vast amounts of information are we going to be able to explore and lost works of old relics and things that have been transcribed on walls that have just faded to, I guess, out of existence. And also, can we get any of this technology in the Vatican? Can I take a digital tour in there? I'd like to check their library out because I know they got some documents out there. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, you know, tech, technology is always neutral, but well, it's not always neutral, I guess. You don't think about a nuclear bomb, but, you know, most of the day-to-day -day technology we use is, is pretty neutral. It's sort of what, it, what do we use it for? Are we, are we using it to extract as much data out of users as possible so we can sell them things or sell that data on to someone else who wants to sell them things? Or can we use it for something kind of, I don't know, kind of, kind of cool, you know, like, um, like, yeah, maybe reconstructing, um, missing passages from, from manuscripts or from, uh, to examine, um, yeah, ar archeological remains and things and, and perhaps reconstructing them more accurately than we have in the past. And, um, uh, you know, certainly like the, the amount of digital stuff that's available, um, medieval manuscripts and stuff like that, that's just available online for anybody to just kind of go and peruse is, is really impressive. Um, and I, I think it's, Again, it's just a question of how are, how are we going to use that technology, right? And um, as human beings, you know, we sort of started talking out talking a little bit about creativity and uh, writing and and so on. And I think we can use technology creatively to make new things or to understand the world better, maybe understand the past better and more accurately than we have, um, or we can just use it to. Um, sell things or to exploit, you know, other people or whatever it is, is really up, up to us. Um, but I, I think one of the concerns that AI uh, kind of presents to, to a lot of us is that as artificial intelligence becomes, I'm, I'm speaking like I'm some kind of expert, but I'm really not, as artificial intelligence becomes more sophisticated, it becomes more autonomous, right? Like it needs us less and less. It doesn't have to keep seeing me type in a phrase like, please find attached, eventually it will know when I start typing, please, I'm probably going to say find attached afterwards. And then it can start to, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe eventually go, go in its own way. Um, and I think we're not, in other words, the technology has a, the potential to get ahead of us, like kind of get out of our control. And I think that's the, the real danger, right? With AI, like, you, yeah. you know, people talk about these things, like if, you know, if, if, if artificial intelligence evolves towards being independent and it sees the only threat to its existence is, is us, you know, like we can pull the plug, then what does it do about us? You know, if it's um, been programmed to kind of survive at, at all costs. Um, and this, this is kind of a long ways from creativity, but I think that, you know, it does point to the way that uh, we, we just, just I, I, suggesting that, you know, this this kind of issue with technology kind of getting ahead of us and uh, 
causing us problems on. Okay, got it. Um, this issue of technology getting ahead of us and posing a threat to us or doing things we don't want it to do, it kind of points to the need we have for imagination, you know, for, for being able to uh, imagine the consequences of what we're doing and maybe being able to uh, think about those and, and imagine those through, through stories, through film, through art and stuff like that. Does it, I mean, is it scary to you or do you think we'll just adapt to something new? Cause that's my only fear from it. I'm not afraid of it taking us out or anything. I'm more of afraid of a concept of like, we just lose a piece of ourselves. I mean, technology, for instance, as much as it's probably upgraded our reflexes and all these other types of things that we have, there's also an issue when it comes to the fact it's got to be taking something away. Yeah. And I, you know, I think, so I, I think what, what we have to what we have to decide as you know as a society maybe as a globe at this point is um whether or not all those trade-offs are are worth it you know i think the advantage of uh, of pausing and imagining the consequences you know maybe through through art through storytelling through film uh, m- might help us make some of those decisions uh better decisions than we've made in the past you know and i think um again kind of coming back to where where we started from today think about creativity and making things and and telling stories and working through feelings and, and so on art is one of the things that defines us as as human it's one of the things that that makes us human beings you know and it's something that artificial intelligence at least at this point can't really mimic um you know or uh simulate it doesn't, it doesn't have feelings, you know, um, it doesn't have that connection to, uh, a body, uh, the way, you know, the way we do. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that fascinated me about Pan is the way that, uh, you know, he's half, whatever, he's half goat, he's half human in his form, but he, you know, he's that connection to a basic kind of animal nature. And I think art, you know, conveys that and it comes out of our experience of being you know embodied creatures right i mean we have bodies we have emotions that kind of come out of uh, our physical lives uh, as well as our inner lives and that's something that is unique to to us it's something we share with animals but it's not something that you know a, a computerized brain however smart it is can uh can replace you know and i think and so I think we, you know, we need to to recognize uh, those aspects of ourselves as as really integral to who we are and and worth you know worth preserving and worth thinking about. You just gave me a good chapter for something in the book: soul over convenience. Soul over convenience. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> when you open up this door for luxuries or things to come in of ease of access, whatever you want to call it. It seems like you lose a crucial step of the soul aspect of things like that AI art that we can sit here and look at and talk about it. There's, I don't feel anything, but it's cool, but I don't feel emotion behind it. But when I stare at a, I've watched the Bob Ross documentary hundreds of times and it's, I mean, it's a great thing when he says the reason why I paint mountains and landscapes like this is because I spent 12 years in Alaska and that was peace to me. And I'm like, damn it, like you're pulling it out of your head and creating it as something different than letting something hear the words that you're saying and create it for you. But I just, I, I hope that doesn't evolve to the point where it's able to fix out that thing. Like, okay, you want emotion? We program this AI to understand emotion. It's like, but does it understand that though? I don't know because the capabilities of it could be endless. But I mean, even with having a blue background behind me, it's a different emotion. It's a different feeling. It's a different type of mood, a small little thing that might change a certain thing, such as if I switch it to red, it just seems aggressive. But it's those small things that I think really I kind of appreciate. And I think that constitutes a lot of what goes into like a work of art that I think a lot of people tend to just think about the basic plot points the climax the you know the enemies the the heroes but what about the basic side functions that play something in the background much like pan like we talked about in the first discussion it's that small little features of those things that might not even get mentioned but they're there i mean i did a scene for one of the film pieces 
and someone goes, you did the, you did the rhythm. You did it in threes. Everything is funny at three, but if it goes past that, sometimes it's not funny. And I'm like, I wasn't even thinking about doing that. Mm. It was just a thing of doing that, but someone pulled that out of that. And I was getting messages over something so stupid where it was like, it's meant to be funny little skit that came in my head, but people were like trying to put like Aristotle art on top of it. And I was like, like the best part about, I don't want to keep mentioning the film, but the best part about it was I literally made a film about a film about a film that I never showed you the film. And I had a bunch of guests involved talking about how awesome this film is. And I gave them a choice <laughs> to whether crap on it or love it. And they chose to, a lot of them appreciate it. And some chose to crap on it, which is what I wanted. But it was faith in something that they just knew who I was, know that they trust me and they just did it. And that was something that was more impactful. And the fact that the first half of the film is voiced over by my buddy, taking an analysis into a film that doesn't exist. Then it ends and my other voiceover actor buddy picks it up the second half. So the first guy didn't know that there was another half to it. He thought it ended with him. So it was like everyone was out of the loop and I was the only one that knew what it was, which is like, that's the real um, wonderment in it all. And I'm like, that's what I want to see when it comes to a work of art. I want to see someone create something that necessarily you think it might be going one way because the world is always based in assumptions, but it takes you off your feet. It has you go a whole different route with things. And it's like, I never saw that perspective, something new where it causes you to look back at it a couple of times, not like, oh, it's a one and done. No, but keeps you coming back. And like an M. Night Shyamalan movie, a lot of people give him shit, but I love it. Yeah, I, I think, right. And I think um, I think the, the art that lasts or the, the art that means the most to us individually uh, is, is the, the art that, um, that we do keep coming back to because there's, there's something in it that kind of defies us, you know, like we can't, we can't totally make sense of, we can't just explain away. Right. And we, uh, I think we, as, uh, you know, as viewers or readers, we're always trying to make sense of things. We're always trying to find meaning in things, but we can only, we can only do that based on what we're seeing, you know? And so if, um, if someone's being asked to comment on a film and they've only seen half of it, right. And they're talking about the film as a whole, you know, they're, they're missing this whole, this whole chunk of it. And so their comments, if we, if we as an audience or whatever are aware that there's a lot more to it, they're going to seem really incomplete, right. Because we, we just know more, more than they do. Um, but I think, you know, thinking, thinking about those AI paintings um, that you were showing a little earlier they they don't have this this kind of human emotion at the root of them like they're not coming out of a, a a lived experience or whatever but i think because we're always trying to make sense of things and trying to find meaning in things we as uh we as viewers kind of bring that to the the painting right and there is something I, maybe because it's uh made by artificial intelligence there is something kind of weird and mysterious in those images right like there's something we can't just just explain away and that that makes them kind of intriguing and mysterious and so i you know i i kind of wonder if if uh you know to, they're, if they're not so much a replacement for the kind of art we have but just a, a new kind of art that uh kind of maybe raises new questions for us about you know what what art is or what does it mean to create something or how, you know how does the creative process work because this ai is doing that in a way that is not that different from what we might do if we're making a film or a story or a poem or whatever it might be. Um, so it's, it's really fascinating, but it does lack that, that human dimension, which even, I mean, you're right. People do give Bob, Bob Ross a hard time, but a lot of people really love Bob Ross too. And there is, you know, there's a, there's a feeling with Bob Ross that he's, he's really sincere. Like he really means it. He's painting those mountains because he loves those mountains. And, um, and that I think is what we're, I think that's kind of what we're, we're missing with those AI images. Um, but even missing them as, as viewers, we just start, you know, we start trying to find meaning in them or try to respond to them emotionally or something like that. Right. It kind of seems like it's because someone, everyone wants something that's personal to them or new to them. 
Like when I create the AI thing, I always hit randomize a couple of times and try and go deep into it to make sure I'm not going to get something that someone else could recreate. But some of the apps that I was using before that one was they would create art and I'd be like, okay, this is something that a lot of people could type in this and get the same exact thing. You want something that's going to be unique to you, like a one-off out of a billion, you know what I mean? And hopefully it's that thing. Bob Ross, for instance, there's so many recreations of his paintings that aren't his. They have people faking his signature to be able to sell it for more money, which is like there's people out there that could sense that it's not authentic. I don't know how they do it, but they know. And it, it, his son knows how to do it because his son knows the trick that his dad put in his paintings to make sure that it was his or something like that. And uh -oh. I'm like, it's that style of stuff where I'm like, that's what everyone wants is a original. They want something that's unique to them and only them have it. That's why these NFTs go for so much money is because there's only one of those things. So people are willing to spend however much to make sure that's personal to them or that's theirs. And it's like, just gets into some weird territory where we start entering the idea of like people just want something that's exclusive for them, but something that they can show to the world. And that's a weird phrase in itself, man. I think it, it is. And I, and I, I kind of wonder if part, part of the reason is that, you know, li living when we do where you know, all images are like infinitely reproducible, right? I mean, you can, if there's, if you want to look at the Mona Lisa, type in Mona Lisa and you'll get tons of images and, you know, different resolutions and whatever, but, you know, there's no, the, you don't have to go to a museum in Paris and line up behind 5,000 other people, right? I mean, it, it, images are so reproducible now. And I think the, what you're describing with the NFTs, which, which I find, I, I, also find kind of fascinating and 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 just weird is the fact that it's a unique thing like you pay for it it's yours it doesn't belong to anybody else and you can you can show it off um but that that idea that it's a non reproducible image unlike pretty much any other image uh that's on the internet i think that's got to be that's got to be a big part of the appeal right like it's something um unique in an age when everything seems yeah, just reproducible, right? It's just so I don't I don't see it being three point five million dollars like people are buying that for. But it's crazy <laughs> I wouldn't to pay see that, that much. I, I don't. Well, what I, I what are you paying pay. for, really? You're paying for the picture, but like people are like, it's mine. It's like, but why are they worth that much money? It doesn't make sense. You're paying for the art, but I can easily copy it and it's mine. It's like, no, but this one's exclusive to me. I have the rights to it. It's like people will use it anyway. They don't care. Yeah, and the ones I've seen, like the, there's a lot of those ones with with monkeys, you know, doing different things. But it's like they don't. They're called bored I mean, apes. Yeah, the bored apes, right? Um, they don't. They're not really creative. I mean, they're they're a little creative, but they got not. bored rabbits now. <laughs> well, there you go. See, that's the that's the human impulse to create. We got. But go, the way they the made that rabbits. different was they used a 3D render instead of an art thing, so it looks more realistic. And then also, right. when this they're making an app with it, where you'll be able to use that art to get an exclusive uh, conference or meeting, depending on how much you pay, with certain A-list celebrities. So then it's going to be its own type of metaverse inside using the art as NFTs. Where I get into this land of like. Currency went from cash to now it's mostly card ones and zeros and numbers. That's eventually going to be items. Items are eventually going to be tradable, much like how it was way back in the day when you used to trade a bowl of fruit for a spear or something like that. That's going <laughs> to happen again, but with non-fungible tokens and moments and all these types of things that are coming out there. I'm just like, I don't want to be behind on the times, but I mean, I mean, I was the one that criticized uh, electric cars. And then now we're, that's looks like that's going to be the majority. Eventually it's going to be phasing out gas. You'll have to be an elite class to have gas cars or a collector, much like maybe a book. You'd have to be a collector yeah. to do a book. Yeah, it's uh, right. I, I don't want to go back to the barter system though. <laughs> Art is dead. Like, Art is dead. It's three, $3.5 million uh, barter system, but, but yeah, it's a, so the, right. So the NFTs, the, there's nothing, it, you're not paying for the creativity, you're paying for the uniqueness. And then, you know, you're talking about this kind of exclusive access, right. That goes with it. And so it becomes, even with the, the $3 million price tag or whatever it is, it's, it's a status symbol, right. It's saying like, I'm, 
you know, I'm so wealthy, I can have this thing that costs this much money, even though it's basically useless and it's not even that attractive to most, you know, most people don't look at that and go, that's, wow, that's an amazing, amazing work of art or it's incredibly beautiful or there's so much skill or whatever. It's just a thing that stands for a lot of money. And I think, you know, that, so it's, it is tradable because it's, uh, it's value is really just in terms of its, uh, monetary value and and the the status it gives right because it gives comes with access to a celebrity or it you know says something about you and the kind of people you know or whatever it is um but it's yeah so it's some it, it it gets to our really sort of basic instincts right to sort of be well thought of or be admired or dominate other people or be better than other people it's it's kind of you know the narrative cha- will change when the bandwagon all hops aboard it. I mean, I used to be personally like these NFTs look like dog trash. Now, when I see them, I'm like, well, that one's pretty cool. It's because you start seeing an overwhelming consensus of this is the new trend, hop on the new trend. And once this, I guess the narrative flips that way, then it becomes appetizing to your eyes for some reason. It's kind of like uh, the lobster theory or whatever it is. If I told you you were allergic to lobster and you ate lobster every single day or you hated lobster and I told you you were allergic to it, you would want to eat lobster now because I told you you can't have it. It's that type of thing. Yeah. And well, I, I think that that is, that is true. I, you know, we're, we're interested in things we can't have. And and I think the other, the other side of it is, I mean, we're, you you know, we're saying we don't, you're saying you thought they kind of look like trash. I'm saying they're not, not very interesting. You know, if we, if we took them seriously as an art form, that's really new, like, like the AI uh, paintings, we'd have to admit that, you know, it's a new art form. So maybe we have to figure out or learn a way to kind of appreciate it or what are what are we looking at it for i mean um is it is it just a status symbol is it just because it's worth all this money or is there something about it is there a way of looking at it to kind of take it seriously and uh figure out you know what's what's meaningful about it and i think that you know at the end of the day the art whether we're talking about films or paintings or poems or stories or whatever it is it is a social judgment like it's it's people coming together and saying this is worthwhile this is not so worthwhile over here and i think that for for a new form of art it takes a long time for people to figure out how to find meaning in it right at the same time though because it's a social judgment we we do want people to be able to tell the difference between uh, something that is worth their attention that can be meaningful and enriching or, or something for them and something that is just there to, to make money or to take advantage of people or to inflate someone's, you know, self-worth or, or actual worth, you know? Um, in other words, you know, is it, and this gets into an endless conversation, I guess, but is it, you know, it's learning to tell the difference between real gold and kind of fool's gold, you know? Um, but if in the end, the majority of people decide that the fool's gold is what's really worth worthwhile, then, um, you know, we, we have to come to terms with that. I don't know. I think it, it raises some interesting questions, <laughs> you know, about w- what is art and uh, how do we decide what's worth our attention and, and what's worth our money as well. It's very deep, very deep. What's real gold? What's real gold or fool's gold? Oh God, it gives me anxiety. <laughs> anxiety can be a good thing. I think we're really down on anxiety, but you know there are things to be anxious about, and and sometimes again to kind of come full circle a little bit, anxiety is one of those things that can that can kind of provoke us to to creativity, right? I mean, it's one of those those really kind of human feelings of unease about things that might, might prompt us to, to try to put that, that into words or, you know, pictures or whatever it might be. But um, anxiety can, can be a source of creativity as long as it's not, you know, debilitating anxiety, right. Where it's got a, where it's overwhelming us, but I don't think feeling anxious about things is, is necessarily bad. And um, you know, looking the world around us and um, you know, the climate crisis and pandemic, there's, there's a lot to feel anxious about, 
you know, and um, that can be a kind of starting point for, for creativity and, and maybe understanding as well, I would say. It's beautiful, Paul. Beautiful. I appreciate you for doing the beautiful. podcast again, my dude. Oh, well, thanks for having me back. It's been fun. Um, is there a place where people can find your links, your books? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> There is, uh, of course, I can't remember my actual website address, but um, I, I'm I'm around. Um, it's uh, I'm at uh, uh, Paul J. Robichaud on uh, on Twitter. If you want to find me there, um, and my new book is Pan: The Great God's Modern Return, uh, published by Reaction. Uh, I got your uh, link. It's PJ Robichaud at or it's not at but dot wix site.com slash author and i'll make sure i link that in that's, the description as well that's too. the one you feel free to edit that out that stuff out that's fine <laughs> <laughs> i'll put that all in the description man i appreciate yeah. you giving me your time again paul um okay nft discussion i'm glad we had that because i've been thinking about that a lot recently yeah it's been everywhere right it's, it's never going to go away it's going to be the new currency we're going to have to sell our house for nfts that's the future you get a polaroid of your house and then that's your house now uh, that that is where we're going, isn't it? Welcome to the metaverse. <laughs>